All right, here we go. Uh, how's it going, everybody? So welcome to the first Q&A video that we've ever done on this channel. Actually, it's kind of exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time. So um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I'm going to do my best to try and answer some of these. Uh, if you don't see your question on here and you think I might have missed it, please feel free to uh, send me an email, which I'll have in the description of the video, or shoot a comment below, and I'll see if I can answer that for you. Um, all right, so just a few things to talk about real quick before we get started. The uh, Ghibli series is dropping in one week. I just finished editing the very first video. It's been posted on Patreon, and uh, I'm kind of excited about this. So I hope you guys find it useful. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I hope you um, enjoy it. But uh, for now, let's dive into what we've got here. All right, so the first question is from Charing Tamang. Sorry if I butchered that name pronunciation. But the question is... How and when to use high and low pitch to make the music sound better? All right, so if I'm understanding this correctly, there are basically two approaches you can have to this question. One as an orchestrational question or a timbre question, uh, and the other as a compositional structure question. So I'll try and answer both. In the first situation, asking about orchestration and timbre, about when to use a... Um, higher versus lower pitch based off whatever instrument you're working with. That simply requires an understanding of the instruments you're working with. For example, a flute is going to sound incredibly piercing, incredibly powerful and shrill to everyone who's listening when playing in its highest register. So then the question you have to ask is that the sound that you're going for? All right, is that what you want? Uh, if it is, great, go for it. If not, then you're going to want to try going a bit lower. In the middle register, but that middle of the three octaves the flute can typically play in. It's a lot more lyrical. It's a lot more sweet. You can kind of think of the uh, Hobbit theme from Howard Shore's uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, so is that the tone quality you're going for? If so, great. If not, you can always try the low register, which is a very weak register. It doesn't have a lot of projecting power. It's a very quiet whisper kind of sound, but it's incredibly rich, very beautiful to uh, listen to and very beautiful to work with. So it's basically that kind of approach with orchestra. What kind of feeling are you trying to convey with your instrument? And selecting which of those, uh, and selecting which kind of feeling you're going for can have an impact on whether you want to go higher or lower in the pitch of the instruments you're working with. Now as a compositional structure, we talked about this a little bit in PDART. Uh, we talked about pitch, dynamics, uh, articulation, rhythm, and tone color. Uh, so the pitch has a big part. So as a compositional structure, if I'm working with uh, one melodic line, all right, and I've been staying mostly in one register, and I know that I want to add some contrast so that the next phrase has a bit more energy to it. At that point, that's when I would consider moving up in register or down in register, or up in pitch or down in pitch. But the idea being that um, you make that decision based off uh, where you are in your music, if that makes sense. Phrase by phrase, one phrase should stick with one register for the most part, unless you have a bit more experience and know what you're doing. So when, and when you're looking for when to switch to a different pitch, I would recommend look, taking it by a phrase to phrase structure. Uh, I hope that answered your question. All right, so the next question is from Danny Beats. They say, uh, I would like to know your opinion about the music industry and also if you have some tips for making a living out of music. Also, thanks for all the free content you share in this channel. I'm waiting for the Ghibli series. Cheers from Spain. All right, awesome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, so first of all, as a disclaimer, um, I wouldn't know if I'm the person to ask about this question. Uh, in terms of I haven't really quite made it yet, and I'm certainly not making my living from music. Not yet, at least. You know, I'm working towards that. Um, the one thing I can offer you here is keep working. All right, Music really is a long game, especially if you're interested in film scoring. All right, Whether it's for TV or movies, a lot of that stuff comes from the long game. Um, and the best way to secure that is to keep working on yourself, keep working on your skill set. Uh, you need to know what your weaknesses are. So you can't be one of those people, um, we all know them, dime a dozen, the person who thinks they're going to be the next hot thing, all right? They're fantastic and there's nothing they can do wrong. 
Um, you've got to be a lot more humble and more realistic in terms of what are you dealing with, all right? How can you improve? What are your weaknesses? And how can you help reduce them? At least for me, that's what I'm working with. You got to keep studying, keep working. And of course, every day, you got to keep writing new music. Do it as much as you can. There's that old adage of going for the 10,000 hours. That means expertise. Now, of course, there is no magic number of 10,000 hours, but the idea is solid. It's found. Uh, keep working. Keep logging the time and keep trying to improve. Other than that, just some basic tips I can offer is um, know your worth. All right, so you're a brand. You should know that. You as a musician, you are a brand. All right, and never do anything that would be off-brand. All right, so make sure you get credit for your projects. Don't only do projects that you think have potential. Well, no, because not all projects are going to be awesome. You're not going to be excited about everything you're writing music for. But um, you make sure that you're not hurting yourself with the things that you're working on. And then lastly, I would say work with live musicians whenever you can. All right, that'll do a lot to help you learn about the instruments, learn about writing for them, and just help building that network. I've got friends who are insanely talented musicians, and I like to write with them and get them to perform pieces whenever possible. Uh, just because there's a certain level of just nuance that a live performer, and even just a real person can bring to music that a computer just can't, no matter how talented you are with it. So sorry if that didn't answer your question, but I hope you found something useful there. All right, so the next question is from Peterson Normal. They say, uh, hello, I love your videos. I have many similar questions. Uh, what would be the next step of ear training if I can accurately identify any interval and transcribe music accurately? Uh, to add on, how can I properly internalize or learn compositional concepts after I transcribe a piece that I like? It feels like I just completely forget about it after I transcribe it. And lastly, is the ability to hear a score in your head a mastery of relative pitch, or is it just a parlor trick for people with perfect pitch? All right, so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you like my videos. Uh, second of all, uh, wow. All right, so congrats. <clears throat> Being able to identify intervals and transcribe music accurately is incredible. All right, it's still something that I struggle with and I'm trying to work on improving. So that's awesome. So in terms of how to properly internalize and actually learn compositional concepts after you transcribe a piece that you enjoy, um, really it just comes down to using it. All right, I wish there was an easier answer. I wish there was a uh, more uh, fancy answer, something I could wow you with. But honestly, it's just a matter of using them. So every time I finish transcribing a piece or I finish studying a piece, uh, the first thing I'll start off with is I'll write down all of the takeaways that I have from it. And you'll see that in the Ghibli, seri uh, in the Ghibli series once it uh, gets published starting next week. Is that something I do? After I analyze one of the pieces, we'll go through a part of the video where I go through all the takeaways, the cool strategies that I find, the things that I find interesting. And it's something I do for myself whenever I follow this. I don't even need to transcribe a piece. I'll be listening to music on my phone and I'll hear something really cool. Like in uh, Hiroyuki Sawano's UC Big Girl from Attack on Titan. Now, right before that incredible vocalizing part comes in, which if you're familiar with the piece, you know what I'm talking about, uh, there is a really sudden pullback. So there's a lot of the music going on, and then suddenly there's a pause for like one second where this huge buildup pauses, and then it goes into the big climax, the big huge thing. And that was just something I thought was awesome. And so once I noticed it, I started realizing that was used in a lot of places. Before lots of climactic moments, it's pretty typical and run of the mill to see that an orchestrator or composer will have a moment of at least a second where they pull back, where whatever they're doing, they reduce the overall size, the overall in just um, the overall instrumentation being used, so that that entrance can be even more dramatic. So what I'll do is when I notice something like that, I'll write it down. I'll have it on my phone in a notebook that I like to carry somewhere. And I keep a master list of strategies and different things that I've noticed while listening to music, transcribing music, studying it, whatever. And anytime I'm stuck with writer's block or I'm just looking to write something, I consult the master list. All right. And the more times I use a specific strategy, the more times I use a specific tool or idea, the more it gets internalized to the point where I no longer have to consult this master list. I just 
have the ideas in my head. I realize, all right, so if this is the effect I'm going for, I can try this. And of course, composition is all about trial and error. Uh, once you try something, if it works, it works. It might not work every time, but you keep trying and seeing what you can learn from it. So hopefully that answers that question. But uh, you said, lastly, the ability to hear a score in your head, is that a mastery of relative pitch or just a parlor trick for people with perfect pitch? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask about that. All right, so I do not have perfect pitch. I have nothing like perfect pitch. In fact, the first instrument I really played for a long time was trumpet. So I've got like the anti-perfect pitch. Anytime I hear a B flat, I think that's a C. So um, that's awesome. What I think it is, is a tool. All right. doesn't matter if something's a parlor trick. If it's useful to you, you can use it. All right. So if you can hear a score in your head, that's fantastic. See what you can do with that. Look through music. Uh, help it when writing your own sketches. Uh, I think that's a blessing. That's awesome. So, no, I wouldn't say that's just a parlor trick. I'd say go for it. Use it uh, in whatever way is helpful. All right, so the next question is from Rafael Rosa, Game Composer. And they ask, uh, what are some ways that you have found to make memorable and singable melodies and how to structure them in a piece? What is the form difference between a short pop piece and a 10 minute symphonic movement? I have noticed that long music can be broken down into two, into standalone two minute pieces. Uh, what are some other ways that you can think about structure? By the way, I'm really hyped for the Joe Hisaishi series. Thank you for all the effort you put into these videos. Well, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, second of all, so your first question, how to make melodies memorable and singable. There are all kinds of adages that you can find claiming to offer ex just such advice, but the ones i found to be the most um, useful are balancing similarity and variation. All right, so we talked a little bit about that video, about this in my video on motifs. Um, and I'll, I do want to go a lot more into detail in it in the future. But finding that balance between something that is similar to the ear and something that is new. Keeping it interesting without getting too complicated. Um, another one is sticking within that octave range. All right, you don't need to be strictly within an octave or the only entire piece of melody remains in one octave. But in each phrase, try to keep it within approximately an octave range. It's easier for the average person to sing within a specific octave than it is to jump out. And if it's singable, if it's hummable, more whistleable, then it's easier to get stuck in the head. And the third thing that I'll offer is phrase structure. You have to get a mastery of phrase structure. Well, you don't have to, but I strongly recommend it. Uh, once you understand proper form, proper function in your music, especially with phrase structure, it opens so many doors for you. All right, It becomes so much, not simpler, but more comprehensive. Uh, with your composing, if that makes more sense. Um, you're able to approach it a little more strategically with that in mind, instead of just fumbling around in the dark or on your keyboard or on the guitar, whatever instrument you play with. Uh, and that ties into your next question about how do you structure them in a piece? So there are a whole lot of different ways that you can structure melodies. A lot of it's just gonna come down to your phrase structure though. You can have binary form, ternary form, periods, paragraphs. There's all kinds of things that you can work with. Um, and I do want to touch on these in future videos because unfortunately <laughs> this is an awesome topic and I can't go too deeply into the rabbit hole on this. Uh, but honestly, so the recommendation I would give for you is if you're interested in reading, uh, get this book. All right, uh, Musical Composition, Craft and Art by Alan Belkin. He's got a YouTube channel actually, fantastic. Uh, it can be a bit dry, a little academic at times, but the information is a gold mine. All right, I cannot recommend it highly enough. In fact, I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. But he breaks you down from the process of writing motifs into turning those into phrases and fitting those phrases into structure. And that's really the key behind composition is how are you properly organizing your music. So next you ask, what is the form difference between a short pop piece and a 10 minute symphonic movement? Uh, all right, so the, the, those are both very broad categories. So the pop piece could be anything from a short jazz improvisation uh, to uh, hip hop, rap, uh, classic rock, any kind of 
popular music that would fit in there. And symphonic movement, of course, could be anything. I'm going to take that for face value, though, and mean, thinking that you mean a symphony. So a symphony typically is consisting of shorter pieces, like you mentioned later on. Um, but I'd say there are lots of differences, and of course you're not going to find many minuets and trios in popular culture. Uh, but the idea of A-B format, of organizing your phrases and structures, of using that variability versus uh, similarity is common both across all music, about trying to balance that. So, yeah, once again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to point you back to this book. Uh, but, yeah, it's a very broad question, but the idea being that uh, it just has to be how you organize the music. So pop music will often follow an A, B, A, B, A, B structure, going from a verse to a refrain, a verse to a refrain. Uh, and symphonic movements can often get a little more nuanced than that, but so can pop culture, or pop music. So at the end of the day, there's a lot of differences, but you want to focus more on the similarities. What do they have in common, and how can you introduce that? And a lot of that has to do with phrase structure and how you're forming your pieces. So I hope that helps. Um... So, I have noticed that long music can be broken down into standalone two minute pieces. What are other ways to think about structure? Um, structure can honestly, you, another way that I like to think about it is a conversation. All right, so structure, let's say you've got two primary motivic ideas, all right? Motivic idea number one is person A. Motivic number idea is two is person B. With structure, a lot of it comes down to who's talking at what time. And beyond even that, you've got, you're separating who's talking at what time, but you're also looking at what are they talking about. If I were to sit here just spouting the same word over again, just going beans, 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 or basketball, basketball, bat well, picking any random word and just tossing them in over, at one after another, after another, after another, I'm not going to get your attention for very long. All right? You might be worried about me for a little bit, but it's not going to be an engaging conversation, if that makes sense. So what we're really looking for is the development of ideas. A conversation can focus on one idea, but as the longer you talk about it, the more you bring in new examples. You frame it this way, then you give an example like this. The conversations evolve and so should your music. Uh, you can have one motivic idea and then you embellish it or you augment it or diminute, uh, diminute it or however you want to say it. Or do any of those techniques where you just adjust it and it grows and it develops. And as that idea develops, the other person comes in and they start sharing their ideas and it provides a contrast to the two sharing against each other and you can compare how are they different, how are they the same. And for personally, that's just the way that I like to think about it, is music as a conversation and making sure that both voices are heard and that both voices are nuanced and treated with respect instead of just being a black and white repeating the same idea over and over again. But again, this is something that could vary from composer to composer. All right, and so the last question I have, and unfortunately I don't have a screenshot from this one, uh, is from a patron asking about the Ghibli series, which we'll be dropping next week, so keep an eye out for that. Um, wanting to know if there's gonna be a lot of theory. All right, so uh, this is my patron Antonio. He's asking about how much theory he should expect from this um, series. I try to keep it on the light side, but unfortunately this is a musical analysis. All right, so there is going to be a need for some technical language. Uh, I try to be clear as we go through the videos, but in order to keep them on the short-ish side, I'm already finding them to be about a minimum of 25 minutes in length each, and that's after shortening them. Uh, I can't go into too much detail on each thing. So hopefully I'm able to um, be clear along the way, but something that I'm considering is once the videos are done or even maybe halfway through as they're being published, I can put out supplemental videos on the music theory involved and just the different concepts that are brought up and maybe get a little clearer on that. So. If that's something you'd be interested in seeing, please let me know in the comments. And yeah, I think that brings us to the end of the video. So the first Ghibli video has actually already been posted on Patreon. So if you're interested, I've got the link below. But uh, just as usual, I want to thank all of you for your incredible support. It really does mean a lot to me. I want to thank my patrons who have been more than generous in taking this step forward with me for this project and making it possible to do future projects like it. Uh, so thank you and in the meantime just keep studying keep working hard and as always just keep writing new music